Welcome back. I am the executive producer, Saul Spady, for the Electric Election Podcast. I'm a- alongside my, well, the host of the Electric Election, Benjamin Backer, and we are here to interview one of the brightest minds in nuclear engineering at TerraPower. His name is Dr. Joshua Walter, and I got to just read this off because your intro is, is too good. We have to read your bio. I don't understand it one bit. Um, <laughs> and Dr. Walter is the molten chloride fast reactor, MCFR, deputy program manager manager and principal project manager for the integrated energy systems at TerraPower. You are pretty much changing the world of energy right behind us. You, sir, can you please tell me exactly what your bio means? Well, I'm a nuclear engineer here at TerraPower. Uh, I work with with about uh, 150 other people to bring nuclear power to the forefront uh, of the industry. And so there's a lot of technology that's that's been uh, developed over the last couple of decades and Terra Power has set forth to take new technologies, uh, bring, bring together the brightest minds and apply those, those technologies to, to the industry. So we look at, we look at nuclear power, uh, how it can be brought it into, the, into the market in safer ways, more affordable, how we can reach more people with its, with its clean energy output. And so not only changes to the nuclear reactor, but how we use nuclear en- energy. We, we, as you mentioned, the integrated energy systems, which is a, a fancy term for let's use nuclear a little wiser. So, I mean, on that note, Bill Gates has for years talked about the importance of nuclear power. And even with the, the latest Net- Netflix documentary that really focuses on nuclear, it's kind of re-upped itself in today's world. He said something that's really resonated with us and I think is something that you can speak to, which is the environmental benefit and the, the human poverty benefit of lifting people out of poverty because of nuclear energy. Can you talk a little bit about how that works and how that sort of environmental and economic growth go hand in hand with nuclear? Yeah, with, with energy poverty, we, it's hard for us to imagine the United States, but, but the majority of the world is still developing and they have access to very, very little energy, uh, if anything, in terms of electricity. And so how do those folks get their food? How do they get, get the resources they need? How do, how do they provide themselves education? And in the developing world, the tendency is to grab what's next to you and use that form of energy. And a lot of times that means burning coal uh, or burning, burning other non-clean fuels. So with nuclear, nuclear is one of these things where if you, if you look at it as a fuel and as an energy source, it's really quite abundant. There, we're, we're not going to run into energy limitations with nuclear power. So when we start with that and, and kind of understand that nuclear could be used for everybody, then it becomes an issue of, well, how do we get them to, to the poorest people in the world in a cost-effective way? Well, I love that point because uh, one of the things that I always think about is in the United States, you might have had to work you know three hours to be able to afford a candle 150 years ago. And now maybe you have to work two minutes to be able to flip the light switch. I mean, that's the type of advancement that something like this would make in Africa or in kind of the third world where they have to work three, four hours to be able to even have light at night. Yeah, correct. And so the the key is to get new technologies that are cleaner and better for the environment to get those to the state where the developing world can use them in a way that's effective for those economies and, and, and those people. And it takes a lot of infrastructure set up. It's not just putting in the nuclear plants. There's a lot of things that have to go with it. But unless we do those things, uh, people will do what they've always done and rely on the cheapest, most available forms of energy. And those are going to be fossil fuels. Yeah, and I think what, what, what's really fascinating about nuclear is that not only is it clean uh, for the environment, but it also has the opportunity to power entire states, entire communities, entire countries. And that's something that most energy sources, at least in 2020, can't boast. And on top of that, like I said earlier, it's clean. So I guess one of the one of the elephants in the room is chernobyl and fukushima and kind of the stereotype that people have around nuclear and i think it's starting to change uh we talked about how it's in the democratic party convention for the first time this year in a long time you kind of see both sides in the united states focusing on it but there still is a negative stereotype can you talk about why that stereotype has kind of been put flat on its face and why nuclear is actually safe yeah, historically people have thought about nuclear and they think about what we've largely been taught and, and especially the generations before us who had to climb under their desks at school to protect themselves from a nuclear blast. You know, we're coming into a new generation that hasn't had to deal with a lot of the Cold War association of nuclear with fear. And nuclear was really, for 30, 30 years plus, was was seen as a, a motive for fear. 
and the new commercial nuclear industry sort of went under the radar and say, you know, we're not part of that, and, and they've led decades of successful, safe operation. Since then, we, we've, as I've mentioned before, we've developed a lot of new technologies. Well, some of these technologies haven't been put into our current forms of nuclear reactors. So the technologies that have developed over decades haven't really been put into place. And so what we look at is, is what kind of new analysis we can do with our new tools and our fancy computers, uh, what kind of new experiments we can do with our new materials, and we start to put those together and we see designs that can be much, much simpler, safer, and more economic. Well, so, I mean, just jumping in there with, with, with the, the cleanliness part of it, I mean, there, the universities across the world have basically come together in different studies and shown that nuclear energy, obviously it's carbon free, but it's also the safest form of energy in the world. Yeah, far few, far few people die in the making of nuclear energy than, than any other form. How, how can we do a better job of educating, especially younger people? Because those are the individuals that I think need to become passionate about this at a bipartisan level to really drive true energy change. We've talked with certain individuals who say, we got to throw everything at the wall and see how it works. But there are certain people who kind of say, but, but not nuclear. <laughs> like, you can't throw that one at the wall. Right. Right. I think a lot of it has to do with exactly what you guys are doing with with really educating or bringing out the message of, about nuclear power, about its safety, about its track record. It, it is uh, the safest industry on the planet. Uh, we, If we look at airlines, right, you never get on an airplane and say, boy, I, I wish this was, wasn't as regulated. And, and so we, <laughs> we think about nuclear and it's this whole system is built up where people where where people are enabled to to make changes to stop things that are going on with within the industry and so it's that reflection and the commitment to safety you know most nuclear engineers work right next to the nuclear power plant so they're they're at the forefront of thinking about how does this stay safe and so together with with the pressure on it uh, pressure on the nuclear industry it, it's had to keep a great track record and and it's done and from the regulation standpoint Obviously, from the 1970s onward, there were a lot of regulations on the nuclear energy industry. Where have those, where did those go wrong, and how did that stifle the growth? And then, how, where where can the government play, and what are what is TerraPower doing currently in partnership with the DOE as well? I don't know that the regulations have, have necessarily gone where they've gone wrong anywhere. Uh, they're all put in place for for reasons that can benefit either the technology or or the or the public and and prevent risks it is it is a deep bureaucratic process it, it's a it's um a lot of the regulation is is people can come in and, and influence the regulation from outside the nuclear industry and and we we acknowledge that we we accept that we have the dialogue that that can t make things in terms of technology development implementing new things at the reactors can make them take a long time and in a sense that's good we we want to have these these ways to do that in order to uh, make sure that everything is at the safest state possible, and that's something something that we do, do we do do. In terms of regulation, in, in what we call the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, and the Department of Energy, which which does funding, there there's been great effort, especially in the past year, a bipartisan effort, by the way, to start putting funding into advanced nuclear to start pushing these these solutions forward. Here in the United States? In the United States. Well, and that's, I think, so important to me. Uh, Benji and I have been talking about this a lot. When we meet with these other people, we're starting to realize, like, to, to make a difference on climate change, to make a difference on the environment, you need kind of a, a global revolution, but it needs to be enacted at a local level, which is really kind of hard to grasp because it makes me think about this reactor, right? You're building one of the safest reactors the world has, the world has ever seen. You need to find find a community that wants to get behind it and build it and realize they're going to have this plethora of energy. It, you need the, the Bill Gates at this global level, but you also need like a city like Issaquah to step up and say, we, we want this here, right? It, it works at, at both ways. Yeah, it does. And, and it's about not just, so for any commercial power, you need a customer and that's usually a locality or, or an entity within that locality. And, and you do need a government partner. So with the regulations we've discussed, with funding these long-term technologies, we really need a consistent you know, government partner, and, and the government, as I mentioned, is supporting nuclear. What it leads us into is needing a long-term energy policy. We need we need support for that's bipartisan, so that when offices switch and, and we switch between Democrat or Republican and vice versa, 
that the energy policy doesn't change with it. Because these problems are so hard, they're going to take a while, and, and we sort of need a, you know, a smooth runway to get these types of complex technologies into the market. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the complex technologies, we walked inside and saw a little bit of it, just a small slice of what you're working on. I guess what was fascinating to me is like when you think of nuclear, you think of these massive smokestack, like big, you know, big buildings. We saw this, you know, reactor that is just tiny. And and I'm assuming it, that might have been a scale, Benji. Yes, of course it's scale. <laughs> and but reactor for ants. Yes, <laughs> but 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 the technology today is becoming really small and really effective, and it's fast and it's really powerful. And can you talk a little bit, uh, without going too too deep in the weeds, with, with what you're working on and kind of this next generation of, of nuclear energy? Right, we're we're actually working on several things. Uh, in a nutshell, we primarily work on on developing new reactor configurations, how how we put these systems together, and we're looking at the materials that allow those reactors to perform well. And so we've made advancements in terms of materials and how we incorporate those materials into the reactor, plus how we model them, and we can sort of predict the lifetimes of these materials in the system. So now it comes back to us. Uh, we never just rely on models to build nuclear reactors. We have to do experimentation. And that really is what sets Terra, Pow Terra Power apart um, from other advanced reactor companies is we do a lot of experimentation. We support experimentation both here in the U.S. We have experiments abroad that, that back up the, the analysis that we do that points to these machines being um, simpler and more effective that way we can have the data to prove prove what we're saying. In layman terms, you kind of described it like the old school reactors are almost like a boiler, right? Like there's just, you, you got water and everything else in there. And then you kind of showed us a newer school reactor that's using more uh, metal. And then I, I got to just mention this because this blew my mind. It sounds like the next one that's like the, the, the big, hairy, audacious goal after using kind of the metal rod is you, you're melting salt and then it's in this molten in environment. Can you go into that a little bit? Because that... I, I just don't understand. <laughs> yeah, so traditional reactors will have solid fuel, uh, especially in the com current commercial reactors, they'll have a solid fuel and they'll be, they'll be cooled by water. And, and so and sometimes we squeeze that water really hard so it doesn't boil. And in some reactors we boil that, that boil the water. And in, and in both cases we eventually make steam and turn a turbine and that turns the generator that keeps all the lights on. In the molten chloride fast reactor, we, we've done something you know, pretty innovative. We looked at the core and we said, well, why don't we get all that structural material out of there? It's prone to failure. And what we've ended up with is a, a core that's really a pot. It, in some cases, it looks like a large trash can. And we put molten salt in there, salt, so your table salt will melt, uh, you know, 800 Celsius, 850 don't Celsius. Don't do this at home, kids. And it becomes liquid. And, and that liquid behaves a lot like water in terms of how thick it is and how it flows. So in terms of the molten chloride fast reactor, we, we put this liquid in a pot, we, we pump it so we can move heat out from it, and then ultimately we, at the back end, we turn a turbine and make electricity. Wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> it's I mean, mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing, and it's also so hard to comprehend. Well, I think that's what makes nuclear difficult, yeah, right? For right. everybody who has to get in here, we have to then kind of talk with an engineer like yourself who's at such a high level. And that we, we have stuff to have broken down. Whereas like solar, you understand, right? Well, and that's probably the easiest one. Can you just tell us what is the output? How how much could you power off of one of these plants and maybe compare it to like, you talk about these huge solar farms, right, right. that they build. How How is your system more advantageous in the power return? Well, in terms of the power return, what we really look at with nuclear is, is especially in the as we look towards what the future of, of the energy system looks like, what the future of the grid looks like in the markets, and we see a lot of uh, variability and flexibility that is needed to, to be into those markets. And so as renewables come on, they, they bring a lot of ups and downs with, with our power supply. And coal, uh, nuclear, in some case natural gas, have always been used to make that steady power that backs all that up. So we've kind of pushed down coal, we've brought in renewables, and we need power that's flexible. And, and so I, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just, you know, on the flexibility part, we, we do need power that's flexible and we do need nuclear, but we're not currently building many new nuclear plants in the United States. How can we get that back up and running and, and how is TerraPower playing into that? We need to get that back up by, and running by lowering the cost of nuclear, 
We need to get it back up and running by lowering the construction time, shorting how long it takes to build. And we need to get it back, all those things come together when we lower really the complexity of the systems. And, and when you're lowering the price uh, of nuclear just in general, is that something that you're looking for from the technology and the government side? Or is it more on the technology? More like How, how, how do you think we can do that? The government can help low, lower costs by by putting into place infrastructure and so it support you know for example we have a the u.s has a fantastic fantastic national lab system and we do a lot of research in conjunction with those national lab services and they also provide facilities for us to do extremely complex testing for example if we want to test one of these reactors where are we going to do that and the facilities at the national labs have been put in place to to do those tests so the government can lower cost and, and lower time frame and just by helping with the technology development. Uh, but in terms of cost, it's really up to the technology in the, at the end of the day to, to one, be able to be built quickly at a low cost, but also to serve uh, a value beyond just, just electrons to the grid. You know, can it back renewables? Can it displace the burning of fossil fuels? Can we use nuclear energy to do things that we really haven't thought about before? Can we, can we take nuclear energy and transform fossil fuels to things we don't burn. I mean, we can run a submarine underneath the ocean using a, a nuclear reactor, right? We should be able to do anything with it. And maybe the, the thing that gets in you know, certain people's minds is the waste. Could you talk a little bit about the waste that comes out of the reactors and maybe how your reactor is, is different? It, it even can sometimes reuse a little bit of the waste to create even more energy, kind of upcycling, if you will, for our, our millennials out there. Yeah, correct. So with, with all of our designs, we, we think about how to extend uh, the lifetime of the fuel in the system. But basically what that means is we're trying to improve the, the fuel economy, the fuel efficiency of these systems. And when we do that, we naturally produce less waste. So with, with advanced reactors, you're, you're able to get to what we call higher burn-up. And simply that means you're going to have less volumetric material at the end of the day to deal with. So the second piece of, of your question is, you know, burning waste. And that's really a complex issue in the U.S. There's other countries that do full recycling of their new nuclear waste, and, and they burn the long-lived stuff that you don't want to deal with. And that's a good solution. However, in the U.S., it's, it's a political piece. Uh, it's a political standpoint that we're not going to reprocess. We're not going to do that. So for now, we're looking at fuel cycles that, that can extend at the beginning the in a sense, the range, how long we can use these fuels. Get more out of the gallon Get of more uranium, out of the gallon. if you, if you right. will. How, how, far, how far off do you think we are from kind of deploying this technology nationwide and globally? When do we get to tour a facility with you, right? <laughs> that's, that's the big question. Right. Well, our, our, our SFR technology, the sodium fast reactor, the traveling wave reactor, we're looking to deploy that to demonstrate it in seven years. So it's not that far off. That's amazing. And so until then, what do you hope will happen in the ener national energy landscape, in addition to the obvious you know, research and, and continued technology uh, in the nuclear space? Where do you kind of hope the energy sector is in seven years? Well, I, do, I hope that we've, we've continued with what I think is getting traction with, we're going to need more than one answer. It's not, it's not going to be just nuclear. We, we tend to think about energy as electricity, but it's really beyond that. It's transportation, how are you gonna make concrete, steel, fertilizers. We have to innovate in those areas as well. There's more to do than just, just greening up the electrical grid. So we got about three, four minutes left. I, obviously, you're thinking at a higher level on energy, on global warming, on the climate than almost anybody on Earth. Is there something that, you know, seven years out, we're going to be touring the facility, but what's what's the big, hairy, audacious goal 10 or 15 years out? What's going to just make our, our heads, like, blow off that only you know about, that you can tell us, of course? Right. <laughs> as long as you've read that NDA. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're complete. The long-term goal is to have reactors that have very, very long fuel cycles that sort of make their own fuel in situ. So it's so a phenomenon that we've known about for some time in the industry and that, that the U.S. led uh, for, for many decades. In that way, we, we always create our new fuel. And by doing that, we can lessen enrichment. And, and so enrichment's this big expensive facility that you need at the front end to concentrate material you pull from the earth into forms that you can use in these reactors, but it's also a pathway that we try to resist other countries developing because of the weapons context. 
So in these systems where we can breed our own fuel in situ, the tra traveling wave reactor is what we call a breed and burn reactor. Uh, the molten chloride fast reactor can be a breed and burn reactor. In those scenarios, we can provide fuel for new generations of reactors from the reactor itself and not have to re rely on, on developing enrichment facilities where we don't want those facilities, for example, being built all over the all over the world. So I've got two really quick questions, I think, and hopefully quick. Um, the first is, in terms of developing countries and using this technology to lower energy prices, is that something that they, you know, we can start working in those countries now, or is that where we're doing the technology research development here and then exporting it, in, you know, in a few years? Well, we can start communication with those countries, and and we frankly get contacted by those countries to, to see when our solutions will be available, because uh, these countries, you know, these developing nations, the smaller countries, and and even larger countries without the infrastructure to do nuclear are looking for nuclear solutions. Wow. Okay. And I guess my other one is, and it's the elephant in the room: Can we solve climate change without nuclear energy? Nuclear energy. It's going to be tough. It's going to be very, very tough. When, when we think about the massive amount of energy the world uses, I think that's, that's the one thing that I think most people just fail to grasp. We're, we're really consuming a lot of energy on this planet, and we need forms of energy that are massively scalable, and nuclear, nuclear is that. Well, it makes me think of these airplanes that are flying over us. We're not that far away from them having battery-powered engines that are powerful enough, but you would need a, a nuclear power plant that can quickly, you know, provide that energy so that I don't have to hear airplanes ruining our podcasts overhead, <laughs> you know? It's a little more silent travel solution, right? It's, it's an exciting world. We're so close to a massive yeah. leap. Yeah, we're very close. Incredibly close. And it's going to be so instrumental. I mean, we're about to drive around the country in an electric car for 50 days. If we had more nuclear power in these communities, you have more charging stations. I mean, the, the, the opportunities are endless when you've got nuclear power. And I think to, to hit on a point earlier, it's a scalable technology that can power entire nations across the globe, which and be carbon free, which as of now is basically the only energy source, clean energy source that can do that at that scale. With a balanced, reliable grid. I think that's the most important part. You have places in California with brownouts. If they had reliable nuclear technology to go with all the renewables, you would have a, a, a balanced grid that could yeah. easily provide the power to everyone. And that's really what, what you're hoping to provide. We don't want to live in a world with renewable energy where you can't get internet from 10 to 5 a.m. And that's and that's what he, you know, I think that's the power of what you were saying. You were saying it's not just going to be nuclear, but you are going to need nuclear as part of that portfolio, especially in a massive way. Exactly. Joshua, what's your final advice to us? I mean, you've, you've really been on the edge of this for, for so long. We're about to drive across the country. What do you hope we find? What's your final words? Well, I hope you find more, more support for, for environmental um, change. I, I, I don't want to call it change because I think it's already going. You know, I think we're already in the, in the, I think we're already in the starting points of, of real innovation in energy. I think going around and, and getting the message to go from, from this side says this and this side says that to both, both parties generally agree. We, we look at bipartisan uh, solutions and we look at solutions that are really beneficial to, to everyone. And I think that's the key, key piece here of the message is that nuclear can be part of the solution. Uh, nuclear already largely is. Needs you know, nuclear, to be. Nuclear <laughs> provides. Real. Yeah. Nuclear provides 20% of the U.S.'s electricity and, and over half of the carbon-free power that we produce. So the potential is clearly there. And I think pushing the pushing the concept that you know we really need all forms of of energy solutions available. I really like that. Just as an ending point for me personally, the the cross ideological you know, opportunities with nuclear, the economic opportunities, the environmental opportunities. I mean, it seems like a home run that we hopefully will see more support for across the country. Uh, but here at TerraPower, you don't care about political party. You don't care about whatever. You, know, you guys are forging ahead with this amazing technology because it, it helps everyone and the environment at the same time. It's pretty fascinating. Well, it's the same way, uh, not as impressive, but the same way that we're forging ahead, forging ahead with this, uh, well, electric election road trip and podcast series. Terra powering effect. Mm, I don't know if that totally worked for no? me. But either way, okay. we got more coming up, more <laughs> more laughs, and more uh, just 
mind-blowing technology from your local communities, from really national kind of innovators like TerraPower. There are solutions. It's a global revolution, but it's being enacted locally all around the country, and we're going to find it out. Benjamin Backer, Saul Spady. Thanks, uh, Josh. Josh, really thank appreciate you it. so much. We're, I can't wait to visit the reactor. Yeah, thank you guys. We're, we're only a few years away. Bring your electric car back. We'll plug it in. <laughs> See you next time. We'll hold you to it. Benjamin Backer. It's all speedy. Yeah, we, we, can, we figured out our names. We're back for the first After Show podcast for the Electric Election Road Trip. All of our friends out there have already seen episode one with Anamari, Lucas Joppa. Uh, now they just finished episode two uh, on Terra Power. Uh, what, what was your biggest takeaway from, from that episode? What was kind of the main thought that, that you want kind of our listeners to kind of settle in with? Uh, of course, we're at Ted Turner's Ranch. This is, this is in the future for everybody. They, they don't even know where we're going yet, but now they know. <laughs> well, now that they know, when you talk about how this is constant as like a constant environmental conservation project, but Terra Power is part of the future, and it's kind of using this idea of conserving places like these for future generations through power that can reduce emissions. And what I thought was really interesting about that conversation was also uplift people from poverty. And I think that that's kind of a really key hook to how we move forward on these issues in America and globally is how can we reduce emissions and also lift people up? Right. And that's this this growth mantra that's kind of coming out constantly in, in in this road trip and and really we're still you know we're still in Washington at this point everybody hasn't caught up to us here in, in Montana I think my biggest takeaway actually and this sounds weird with all the smoke behind us but it's seven years away mm-hmm. right as much as this is something that we have to work on right now this is really Terra power is a part of you know how we're gonna combat climate change in the next decade a lot of work's been put in we need to keep driving that work forward we can't lose track but we still need to actually go out into our forests and do work right now while also working on that far-reaching big technology. Exactly. And I think what was really interesting about the TerraPower interview was that, you know, we talked about also the importance of all the different energy sectors. You know, you mentioned, you know, we're, we're in the nuclear business, but we know we need renewables and we know, you know, we need to work on traditional energy sources and we know we need to do force man. Like he, he, he said all of those things because he, he realized that, and and Terra Power realizes this, and Bill Gates realizes this that it's it's this any of the above strategy of you know even if you're in the nuclear industry you can support the importance of other sources of energy and I thought his caveat of that was really interesting and you don't hear that a lot right well and to the other side I, I hope people who are hearing this who are maybe like not enthused about nuclear understand that if you want to stop having brownouts in california if you want to have a really strong renewable grid you're going to need some energy source that is reliable and that's what nuclear is it's going to be a a, probably a foundational cog to this uh renewable energy revolution and and we can't leave it behind exactly and we don't have to leave it behind because it's economically sound and environmentally sound. And I think it's starting to pick up some steam. I mean, you have the Democratic you know, National Convention, including it in their platform for the first time. Woo! <laughs> They're like, no, but seriously, yes! <laughs> relief. Sigh of relief. All right. Now we got both sides at the table on that. Um, but you've also got, you know, people like Bill Gates, you know, the wealthiest man in the world, arguably. Obviously, it goes back and forth. You never really know these days. But, you know, one of the, if not the most wealthy person in the world, investing heavily in nuclear energy. And I, so I think I think we're getting there. But there is this stigma that exists that we did talk about in our interview that was basically, you know, there's this older generation that saw these disasters happen. But we've gotten to a place with nuclear where those disasters are not even close to reality anymore. And in 2020, as we discussed, nuclear is the safest energy source in the world on top of the economic and environmental impacts that it has. Right. And you even have countries outside of the United States, like France, for example, that that produce so much that they sell to their neighboring countries. I don't think we're ever going to get to that level in the United States. The scale here, our energy needs are are, are a bit vast, <laughs> but um, it, it's... It's important. I I know I joked about the concept of like a nuclear power plant being built in a city, and, I, and maybe I'm run a whale. I, no, we're gonna let that one go. Uh, but I, <laughs> I'm not even. I'm not even gonna. Dive Shout out to that. Quill for that one. I'm still not gonna dive into that. But you mean dive into it like a whale dives into water? But it's fascinating that we're so against these being near us, but we completely accept that you can have your submarine commandos, you know, right next to a nuclear reactor 
under the ocean. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, we've had nuclear for the past 30 years that has been evolving, growing overseas, like you were talking about in France and other countries. And there haven't been these disasters because the technology is at a place where now we have an opportunity to not have those disasters happen. And and literally every research institution in the world, by a, a long shot, has said nuclear energy, you know, harms the least amount of people out of any energy source and it's partially because of the technological improvements it's it's also smart some smart government involvement um but you're seeing a country like france reap the benefits of of exploiting the 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 benefits of nuclear power well and with terra power i guess this is kind of my final note on it. it's so exciting because they're making advances in how they deal with the waste they're figuring out how to burn more of the waste so there's less of it there's other countries that are reusing the waste to create more energy uh i know this is very nerdy and probably no one knows this but millennial wise it's like upcycling i said that on on the interview you know you're taking something else you're and you're using it again this should be something the sustainability in the environmental community likes there's so there's it's just it just makes so much sense. It does. It does. And it's a, such an important part of our energy portfolio. If you follow along the road trip for the rest of the road trip, we'll be hitting a couple other nuclear facilities. And Wait, really? Yeah. This is going to be a joke of the road trip. I have an innocence. I, I have no idea who we're interviewing. It's always That's the gift of every day is who are we talking to? And you know what? We're going to be talking to nuclear at some point and you won't know until the day of. Well, <laughs> with that... None of you know, just like me, what's coming up next on the Electric Election Podcast. This is our first after show podcast. We really appreciate you for following along, tuning in, uh, go to- Dealing with us. Dealing with us. You can go to tcc.eco if you want to learn more about the Conservation Coalition. And of course, uh, stay tuned because th- th- I'm not- there are a lot We don't know what we, ha- we have. You don't know what we have coming up, but we've got more coming up. Well, I was going to say there's a lot more. I was going to be tired. Like there's a lot more episodes. That you don't know who we're interviewing. Well, with that, we'll be back soon. 